Welcome to the Age is Irrelevant podcast with your host, Helen Fridge. Helen is a 60 plus lifelong competitive athlete, flight attendant, published fitness model, writer, IFBB bodybuilding pro, and certified wine specialist who believes that your age is irrelevant to pursue goals, dreams, and desires. Are you a woman in her 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond who still has a burning desire to pursue a dream or a passion? Are you thinking about starting a new chapter in your life, but you're hesitant, thinking that you might be too old or just don't know where to begin? The Age is Irrelevant podcast is a podcast devoted to women who want to defy the odds, smash barriers, and redefine happiness and success after 40. It's time to make a difference. There is no need to dread blowing out that added birthday candle every year. A new movement is slowly taking momentum, where being over the hill just isn't relevant anymore. Age labels are being thrown out the window, and women are rediscovering the strength within themselves to make a difference, not only within their own lives, but also touching and inspiring the lives of other women. Join Helen as she and her guests discuss all aspects of aging after 40 and how to make the aging process and those twilight years more rewarding, exciting, and fun. Hello and welcome to the Age is Irrelevant podcast. I'm your host, Helen Fritch, and this is episode number 66. So I have a question for you. How many of you out there ever wondered what it would be like to work for the FBI, the Secret Service, or the CIA? Those specific government agencies always fascinated me. I was actually on a layover one time in Washington, D.C. years ago, and one of my coworkers was actually dating a guy with the Secret Service. She asked me if I wanted to go with her to the White House because he was giving her a behind-the-scenes White House tour. Of course, I jumped at the chance. The tour was fascinating, hearing about what went on during the course of the day at the White House. Well, today we are getting a behind-the-scenes breakdown of what it's like to work for the Secret Service with my guest, Lauren Fernandez, or as she's better known at work as Talk Back Barbie. We will be hearing what it's like to work for the Secret Service, the training involved to get into the program, some of her experiences throughout her career, and why she wrote her book called Talk Back Barbie, The Secret Service Edition. It's a fun and fascinating interview that I hope you will all enjoy. But before we get to the interview, I would like to thank my sponsors, The Amino Company, for sponsoring this show. Now, recovery when working out is the single most important part of any training or exercise program. And their product, Heal, by The Amino Company, supercharges your recovery by accelerating muscle growth and repair faster than any other protein source. Heal contains essential amino acid formula first designed for astronauts to trigger muscle growth in space. In clinical trials, Heal has been shown to trigger muscle growth and repair more than three times larger than any other high-quality protein such as whey. You'll see bigger gains, faster recovery times, and improved performance with Heal. Now, since building muscle takes a lot of energy, the total intake of essential amino acids must be increased as well, which is why I'm glad I discovered Heal by the Amino Company. It's a 100% science-backed blend of essential amino acids, creatine, and whey protein that is proven in clinical trials to be more than three times as effective as whey protein alone. I recommend taking it for a post-workout recovery to help reduce the stiffness and soreness that slows you down so you'll feel stronger and bounce back quicker. This science-based amino acid blend is designed to replenish your sore muscles after tough workouts. Heal is great for post-workout nutrition and is more than three times more efficient at triggering muscle growth and repair than any other protein source. Heal is safe effective and tastes great and that's why it's trusted and relied on by elite athletes to provide superior recovery and improved physical function you can check out their science by visiting aminoco.com slash hf30 to get 30 percent off again that's aminoco 
A-M-I-N-O-C-O dot com slash capital H, capital F, three zero for 30% off your order, plus you'll get a free gift with every purchase. And now without any further ado, let's get to the interview. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm super excited for you to be here because I've never really had a guest like you on my show before. I'm I'm just ready for all this juice. It's going to be so fun. Um, And for my listeners, I am talking to Lauren Fernandez. Now, Lauren is an author. Uh, She was a political science major. And right after school, she went immediately to work for the Secret Service. And so we're going to hear all about that. And what I really found so desirable, so fun, is that she wrote a book called Talk Back Barbie, the Secret Service Edition. And it's a comedy about her experience working with the Secret Service as a girly girl. And with, I think, the Secret Service just being this male-dominated, you know, stigma, I'm sure your takes about a lot of stuff are going to be really fun and interesting to um, listen to. But before we get into that, I always like to ask my guests, you know, where they grew up and how their path took them to, like, for example, you know, why did you get into political science and why did you go down that route? So let's just start off from the beginning. Of course, I would love to. So I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. So I grew up here. I went to a small Christian school growing up and my dad always wanted boys, but he had two girls instead. And so he raised uh, my sister and I like boys. He was like, well, (laughs) God's not going to bless me with sons. I'm going to raise my daughter like my daughters like boys. So we were raised with year round sports. There was no crying. You just had to be very tough. And so being raised like that, uh, my dad would constantly always ask me every day and my sister too. What do you want to be? Who? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I would say your typical answers. Oh, a vet, a scientist, a teacher. You know, you're just thinking all these crazy things and you have no idea. Well, one day I sat down and I said, I want to be an FBI agent. And my dad was taken back and he was like, what, an FBI agent? So I, I took that and I started researching and reading books and watching all the shows about FBI agents and what it took to become an FBI agent. And I was obsessed and I I loved everything about it. And since age 10, that was my goal and my dream was to become an FBI agent. So every college I looked at, it had they had to have different majors that I that the FBI would accept. And so I went to Virginia Tech and they had plenty of majors to choose from. And me being thinking I'm a lot smarter than I am, I go straight in as a computer science major and discover that that is not a good major for me. I cannot sit behind a computer all day and type code. So I went to three other majors and I ended up landing on political science, pre-law basically is what I ended up doing. And that was a major that you could potentially go to law school if I chose to, which I chose. I didn't want to go to law school, but I knew I could get into the secret uh, FBI with political science. However, being just out of college, the FBI does not hire you. You have to have at least a minimum of three years professional work experience or military experience before you can get into the FBI. So I applied for the NSA, National Security Agency, and the Secret Service. So the application process is actually in my book and the stories are hilarious because I am not one of those girls who is very good at keeping her mouth shut, hence the nickname Talk Back Barbie. That was my (laughs) nickname in the Secret Service. And I'm very opinionated And I just love people and I love to talk. And so ever since I was in school, I would always get in trouble and sit down into the hallway because I was talking too much. And being in a military environment like the Secret Service, that's not necessarily the best trait to have. Uh They want you to just (laughs) obey. They they want a yes woman or a yes man, right? And I was not that type of person. So obviously, I applied to both the NSA and the Secret Service. I got into the Secret Service. And I did not make it through the NSA process because of the polygraph test that I had to take. And they they basically failed me for the polygraph because I was lying, quote unquote, about my drug usage, which is not true. I never did any drugs. But the story is hilarious because they really just wanted you to stay, to tell them I never did drugs and drop it. And I started going into these long, hilarious stories about how I took Excedrin when I was in college with some alcohol and I didn't know if that was going to make me drunk. I 
I painted um, a poster board in a closed area and got high on the fumes. No, I'm not kidding. I'm telling this person. Oh my gosh. Stories. And she is looking at me like I am insane. And I was like, I know people who gave prescription drugs illegally in college, but I never did that. And she's like, who are you? Like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about you, you personally. What did you do? And I'm like, uh, I, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> and so they failed me because I talk too much. And they're like, well, we can't have you if you're going to tell everyone your life story when you're being interrogated. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> true, so true. I was a mess and I didn't know this. I was super young and inexperienced at the time. And so I was, it was a learning experience for me. And I learned a lot through that process. Wow. That's really, really interesting. That, that's <laughs> funny. So, okay. So then, so, so take it from there then. So since you failed the test, I mean, what was your, what was plan B? So I failed the NSA polygraph, but I had already passed the Secret Service. So I was trying okay. to go okay. both routes down down both pathways and then have them both accept me. And then I was going to make the best decision for myself okay. was my goal. And my I, But I failed the polygraph with the NSA. So my only choice was the Secret Service. And they accepted me and I got in and I passed all of the tests with the Secret Service and went straight into, once they hired me, I went straight into six months of intense federal federal law enforcement training, which I had never experienced anything like that before. Now, growing up, I did a lot of sports, but I, I had never experienced this type of an intense training with the push-ups, the pull-ups, the runs at five in the morning, just really pushing yourself to maximum capacity and your, your max limits that you could take. I mean, you're getting punched in the face, you're getting thrown down on the ground, shooting hours and hours, reloading your magazines over and over to your fingers are blistered. I, it was just, it was very, very intense. And I learned a lot about myself going through something like that because I was immediately discriminated against the minute I walked through the door with my two pink Barry Bradley bags for training. That's what I came through the doors in. And one of the technicians or instructors, he looked at me and he was like, she is not cut out to be a secret service officer. I am, we are not going to have her pass training. And he set me to fail from the very beginning from before I had even spoken. He looked at me and was like, she's not going to make it through training. And I'm going to make sure of that because he didn't think I was qualified just by the base, basis of what I looked like. Right. So sounds like a familiar movie that we've all seen 15 yeah. times. <laughs> exactly. Um, right. So, um, but I wanted to prove him wrong. Yeah. Oh no, that's great. I think, I think it's awesome. And were there any other women in your class? So there's one other woman in my class. However, she was polar opposite for me. So she was definitely more boyish. She was just a tough cookie. I mean, she had already done some military in her background. She was very tough and she was set out. Obviously she's a woman. So she set out to prove that she's stronger and better than the men. So she, when she would compete against me, it was like she went all out because she wanted to show that she was the best woman in our in our class and that she was better than me and even a bunch of the guys. So she was very rough and tough on me personally. And how did you handle that? Well, at first I'm not used to getting punched in the face and I'm not used to getting handcuffs slammed on your wrist. And, you know, you get Indian burns over and over while you're learning these techniques. And at first I was stunned, to be honest with you, I was shocked and kind of like, I, I have to punch this girl in the face, even though we had gear on to protect you, you still have to punch someone in the face and you have to take it when they punch you back. <sighs> and so I'm getting kind of knocked to the side and I'm, I'm like, what is going on? You know, but I'm like, if I don't do this and succeed and pass, I I'm not going to graduate. So I had to dig down really deep inside and just be like, Hey, this is training. This is what you have to do. If someone's in front of you, you've got to punch them in the face and you've got to be able to handle this. And so I just really dug down deep and I did what I had to do. Uh, and I just gritted my teeth and through the pain and everything that I had to deal with, I just, I compartmentalized. I'm, I think I'm very good at that where I can take pain and put it kind of aside temporarily just so I can get through a situation. And I did that the whole time during training. Oh, that's awesome. So were there any parts during training? Like I know when you first go into training, I think it's just like when we first start anything new, you're apprehensive and you don't know what you're doing, but once you finally got settled in and you're plugging away, I mean, how, as far as your focus and your goals, I mean, did you ever waver at one point and think, oh my God, this is not for me? Did you think, oh my God, this is for me? And, and you know, just 
barreling down the road? I mean, were you like dying to see the light at the end of the tunnel thinking, oh my God, I, that six months can't get here quick enough. I mean, take us kind of through your training. I was definitely ready for it to end, but I was, I was really excited because I think the more I went through and the, the more I proved to myself that I could do something that nobody else thought I could do, the more determined I was to graduate, especially when a technician is already looking down on me and thinking that he, he wants to fail me. And so to be honest with you, that motivated me more to prove to him that I was going to get through this and I was going to graduate. And that's what I did. So every day that he threw something hard at me with all the firearms training, all the tactics training, mat room training, I just kept getting stronger and I would go to the weight room and and weight lift uh, in my off time just so I could get stronger, so I could do more pull-ups, so I could do more push-ups, so that I just looked better and I was able to succeed in anything that he put me, whatever situation he put me in. And one of the situations he put me in, he we were doing this technique where you throw somebody over your shoulder. So they come up behind you in a chokehold and you grab them and you toss them over your shoulder. And everybody else in the room is with somebody of similar stature, similar weight, because when you're in training, you need to be with somebody similar so that you can learn the techniques correctly so that you don't get hurt or injured. Right. However, he put me with, I'm was the tiniest girl in the obviously one twenty five five, And he put me with the largest guy in our class, six, five, 300 pounds, And I had to flip him over my shoulder and then he had to do the same thing to me. And we did this over and over and he was being as gentle as he could be, but falling from six feet, five inches on a mat, I was knocked out of my, knocked out of air every single time. And so I'm laying on the ground. I'm like, uh, like catching my breath. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go and do this again and again until that you rotate until you go to something else. And he just, this instructor just kept putting me in situations like this, but I, as much as it, it never made me angry. That's what's so funny. It made me motivated to be like, Hey, okay, you're going to do this to me. I'm going to prove to you that I'm going to get through this no matter what. And that even though I'm getting knocked out of air, I can handle this. So, but what he didn't understand is that he was actually putting me in situations where they're more real life situations than what other people were dealing with. I was just in real life. You don't know. Yeah. You don't know what weight per weight limit you're going to have to take on in real life. So he yeah. was actually helping me when he thought he was hurting me. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good to know. Um, did you ever, when you finally graduated, what was your rapport with him at the end? So I never spoke to him again, but at graduation, he, I walked off the stage when I got my badge and gun and my certificate for completing training And he tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around. I was like, oh crap, what does he got to tell me now? You know, and I was scared. He always intimidated me, but he kind of gave me a backhanded compliment. And he basically told me he never thought I was ever going to make it to graduation, but congratulations. I finally deserved it and I earned it. Um, And that was the last time he ever said any, we ever spoke or he ever said anything. And I was elated because I was working all training to get those accolades that he never would give me. And he finally told me, you know, what I wanted to hear the whole time. And so I was that to me, that was almost more exciting than graduating the Secret Service training is just to hear him give me words of praise. And I say praise in quotes because it was a backhanded compliment, but still I take it super positive. (laughs) Yeah, no, that that's great. So um, once you once you graduated, then, you know, where were you stationed and how did all that go? Yeah. So I went straight to the White House. So there are three different posts you can go to. You can go to the vice president's residency, foreign mission branches, or the White House. And most of us usually go to the White House. So I was stationed at the White House. President Bush was the president while I was working there. And you just, you work around the clock and you're on shift work. It, it's, it's kind of boring, to be honest with you. I, you go through all this intense training and it's so stressful and your, your adrenaline is running for six months straight. And then you get to the White House and you're guarding posts and you're doing the most important job ever because you're protecting the president of the United States, except for there's really no, there's no action because if there was action, that means the president's life is in danger. So it's this tug of war about your job is so important, but when you're, but it's boring unless something exciting is happening, but you don't want something exciting to happen because then your life is in jeopardy. So it's like this balance of, you know, what you want. And so I would be get in trouble all the time at the white house and write all these memos because I'd be caught reading or doing Sudoku puzzles or, you know, whatever it might be. 
And it's just because you're bored and you're trying to fill your time. <laughs> right, right. I'll never forget. Um, I had a uh, DC long layover. I was flying with a friend of mine who's actually dating a guy. And I wish I could remember his name, but um, he also worked for the Secret Service. And he was on Hillary's detail. Um, it was when Hillary and Bill were in the in, in the office. So she reached out to me. She said, hey, she goes, um, I'm going to get a behind the scenes White House tour uh, today. Do, do you want to come? And I go, yeah. And so it was really incredible that we, you know, got to go in the side, you know, the, uh, the White House and bypass all the tourists and peek in, you know, the Oval Office and, you know, um, the, the state room and the press room and the Rose Garden and all this stuff. And then we went downstairs and uh, it was kind of funny because we could see what where they were. I guess there's a board down there where, you know, shows where they're at and then what they were having for dinner that night. It was just really, really, it was super cool. Something I'll never, I'll never It forget. is. Those White House tours are amazing. And actually as a Secret Service officer, when I was working there, I loved to work those tours because I got to talk to everybody and all these individual people and the excitement on everybody's face, just being able to come into the White House, which is something I took for granted because I was there every single day. But everybody was just so excited and happy to be there. And they, they were just in awe. And it was just really cool to be able to experience that day in and day out with the White House tours and see how excited people were to do that. And I thought what I found very fascinating, too, was literally inside the White House, and I'm, I'm sure I'm exaggerating, but, you know, for me, <laughs> it was like every six to nine feet, every six to 10 feet, there was a Secret Service agent just mm -hmm. stand, standing in the hall just standing there. And I was like, Oh my God, they're everywhere. And then they were talking, we were outside in the Rose garden. They were talking about the lawn and then the front lawn where there's motion detectors and then there's beams and, you know, all kinds, it's just like, and I think just as a normal citizen, you don't think about all right. the security. And then they were talking about the detail when they leave and have to plan a trip that people leave a week before and they're scoping out all the different buildings and where a sniper could be and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it was, it's, right. it was something that I'll just never forget, but. Um, yeah. All the protection on the front lawn yes. uh, is for the, all the fence jumpers. So yeah. that's, that, that's basically to stop somebody before they make it even close to the white house. Yeah. I mean, you've, they, you've got to protect the president. I mean, and just think that fence isn't even that high. So, right. you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's not even like he has a huge fortress protecting him. He's got us and snipers and a fence and some lasers. So we've got to be really, you do have to be very diligent. Yeah. But I turned, you know, I took my book and I had such a different take on the Secret Service because of my situation and how I entered the Secret Service and how different my perspective was. And you see all these books and movies and it's all serious and it's all about, oh, I did this and I protected the president of the United States. But I wanted a humor, humorous take on the Secret Service, the whole side of it that nobody sees, the pranks that you play when you're bored on one another, the stuff that you do behind the scenes, the stuff that nobody knows about. And that's what I wrote about because it's funny. And I just, I love to laugh. And I think humor is just so important, especially in this day and age with everything going on. And I wanted people to be able to see a completely, take a serious career and see something completely different with it. Right. Well, you, your life motto is if you trip and fall, <laughs> laugh first then get up and keep going because the only way that you fail is if you never get back up. So I, I love that. So, so what made you decide and how long were you in the secret service for? So I was not there very long. I was there for a year and a half and that's it. And it was because I got burnt out. What I said earlier, the shift work, I was newly married at the time. It was, I was missing every holiday because you have to work the holidays right. and I wanted to hang out with my friends. My days off could be canceled in a split second because they needed people to be, to be at work. It was just, it was very difficult and day in and day out of working that type of monotony and sometimes just being in a post and being bored and being sleep deprived because some days I could go in at 6am and work till two, two 30. And then I, they would be call me and be like, Hey, you've got to go into midnight shift. So that evening I had to go back to work at about 10 30, 11 and work through the night and you had to be able to stay awake and handle that. And it's, it is so difficult and you are burnt out. I mean, anybody who's done shift work understands how, how it just, it wears you down so quickly. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just, with being newly married and I'm a family person, I love being with my family. I just knew that the shift work was just not going to work for me. And that's what kind of 
changed my path and why I didn't go the FBI route anymore. Because once I had experienced the federal government and what it was like and the traveling and doing this kind of stuff, I realized that the FBI was going to be even more of this traveling and all moving, actually even a lot of moving too. You'd be moving to different states all the time. And I just realized that I needed to change my direction and what I wanted to do if, since I didn't really enjoy that type of work. Right, right. So once you make the decision to get out of the Secret Service, then you're thinking, okay, now what? Right. So I, my biggest mistake that I made was not, I jumped the gun too quickly leaving the Secret Service. I took the first opportunity that was presented and it was a horrible situation. And I, I literally worked for this law firm for four months because I, I was hired immediately after the interview. And I was like, Hey, I get to get out of the secret service. So I took it, but it was miserable. It was a horrible situation for me. It was, I was on a all woman women's team and they behind my back were telling me, well, to my face, they were telling me I was doing a great job, but behind my back, I was making mistakes and I had no idea I was making these mistakes, but they were correcting them without me knowing. And so at my three, four month evaluation, they, they told me, I would, they read all this stuff that I was doing. And I, I was like, they told me to my face that I did that correctly. So they basically let me go because they had been lying to me the whole time telling me I was doing correct work when I wasn't. And it was just, I, I don't think they liked me. I think it was just a perception. I think once I got in there, I just, I think that they, it was because it was women and I was, they were all single and I was married. I just think there was a lot of this jealousy stuff. And you're in DC too. And I, I'm just not that type of person. I'm just a very real person. And I just, I love to just be friends with people and just talk to them and be real. And it just wasn't like that. So my biggest mistake was I jumped the gun too quickly where I, if I had waited patiently and applied, I would have gotten right into government consulting, which is what I eventually ended up doing anyway. And I, I wish I hadn't done that, but I learned a great lesson working there and it taught me so much. And again, it made me even stronger and more motivated to prove myself to others. Right. So living in DC, I mean, of course, today, the political climate is like, in my opinion, nothing like it's ever been. But back then, living, living in DC, how was the political climate back then? Like, you know, you get off work, you go to happy hour, you want to go you know, out with your friends or, you know, whatever, you know, what, what was that like? You know, it was pretty normal. I mean, it was, I'll tell you this. I mean, I was the minority up there, to be honest with you. I, with my, I'm obviously born and raised in Georgia. I'm a Southern girl. I have very conservative values and morals. For me, I was the minority. So I do believe it's still similar even now. Like some of my friends that I'm still talking to and hanging out with, I do think Trump being president has changed a lot of things. I think it's made things more extreme than it's ever been. And then I think it's torn so many people apart and created so much division within people. So I do think the climate up there is a lot more different now than it was when I was up there. Now, that being said, I think it's still similar. I just think it's very, very divided. Um, I I just, I, I don't know. I just think it's, it's more intense now. No, no, I, I agree. I mean, it's kind of funny because I am a registered Democrat, but in the past, mm-hmm. I would just look at, you know, yeah. who I thought the best candidate was, and then I would vote on the candidate's ability. Right. And, and if I believed that they would do, do a good job for me, I never voted straight political line down, right. down the way just because I'm affiliated with, with the Democratic, you know, party. You're and, exactly right. And so, you know, it's kind of funny how everything is just so extreme today. It and is. I, and I didn't really see that back then either. Um, I had friends who lived in D.C. and I would hear some stuff and some, you know, and they would talk about stuff like that, too. And even with me, uh, at one point I was married. And when I separated, my sister was living in Virginia and I actually um, moved up there and worked as the temp um, for AT&T, but we would go into Georgetown or go into the city and stuff like that. And it was, it was really fun, but it was just, it was really, really interesting to see how DC operates versus other cities, you know, throughout the, throughout the country. No, they do. I mean, they, it is, it is definitely very different, but I agree with you. That's how I I look at candidates based on what do they stand for and how does that align with me? And that's exactly what I vote on. So I'm the exact same way. 
Yeah, I've, I've voted for many Republicans in the past. I'm going to take a quick break so we can hear from our sponsor, The Amino Company. Now, as a bodybuilding athlete prepping for a contest, I normally train six days a week. It's crucial that I keep my body free from injury and can recover quickly from strenuous workouts. Having Heal in my supplement arsenal enables me to do both. First, developed for astronauts to maintain muscle mass in space, Heal is a patented blend of essential amino acids, creatine, and whey protein that is clinically proven to be more than three times more the efficient, more efficient at triggering muscle growth and repair than whey protein alone. So if you're looking for an advantage for optimal muscle recovery and growth, I recommend you give Heal a try. And right now, you can get 30% off when you visit aminoco.com slash HF30. Again, you'll get 30% off your purchases when you visit aminoco, that's A-M-I-N-O-C-O dot com slash capital H, capital F, three zero. Plus, you'll get a free gift with every purchase. And now, back to the show. He helped vamp it up and make it better because he had written some books in the past. And so I was like, hey, why don't we work together and just see, you know, how you can make this better? Because I had already written as much as I possibly could. And I just, I knew it needed to be even better. And so he helped me with that. So it was just an inspiration because I wanted to share with people, first of all, like I said, the humorous side of the Secret Service. But I wanted to share with people my story because I do think it's so empowering. And not just because I went into the Secret Service, but empowering for men and women who have dreams and who have these stereotypes and these titles and these nicknames that are put on them. And they let them def- that those define them. And so my story is all about not letting titles and nicknames define you as a person, but instead you defining who you are as a person and you proving to others that you can do maybe what everyone else thinks you can't. And it's about just being strong and digging down deep and just making yourself propel forward, even through the negativity, even through the failures. It's about just keeping your head looking at on the horizon. And because if you don't, and you just let, you take all this stuff and you internalize all this negativity, it's just gonna, it's gonna turn you into that type of person, a negative person who looks at everything. So, you know, glass half full or half full, and you're just gonna look, go through life kind of moping and thinking, oh, I just got all the bad handouts. But instead, I'm honestly, I got a lot of bad handouts in the secret service. I got a lot of them, but I didn't let that define who I was. I wanted to prove that I'm stronger than just a Southern blonde debutante that everyone thought I was on the surface level. Because once you get to truly know me as a person, you'll realize like I am nothing like a Barbie doll at all. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) Well, and that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to you that I wanted you on the show because knowing that the Secret Service and the FBI are so male dominated Mm -hmm. and that I'm guessing with the training that you had to go through a lot and endure a lot to actually get to where you graduated and you were actually able to start, you start your job. And I'm such a firm believer in, you know, my podcast is called age is irrelevant because, you know, in my opinion, you should be able to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it, whether it's at 20 or whether it's at 70. And I think, you know, with us, me being in my sixties, you know, back way back when I would look and go, oh my God, 40 is so old and 50, you know, I'm, I'm just dreading all that. But then I finally hit 40 and it was great. And 50 was great. And 60 is, was great too. And life just keeps getting better for me. And I think now society is finally opening up and actually accepting and realizing that just because you're in your 40s or 50s or 60s or even beyond, that you still can't do incredible things. And you no, still can't, you, you still can't have dreams and goals and aspirations that, you know, you can have those dreams and goals and aspirations that are attainable versus, oh, I'll never be in the secret service. Oh, I'll never, you know, whatever. It's like, well, never say never. I mean, and that's why I want people like you on the show just to inspire women that, you know, you can do it. Now, the path might not be easy. It's not going to be a little yellow brick road, but, um, you know, if you, if you have a positive mindset and you have this eyes always forward and you are open and receptive, you know, I'm a big person on the universe and I'm always talking about being open and receptive to the universe because the universe always has your back and it's always giving you clues and hints and, um, you know, and and offerings and gifts 
because they want the best for you. And so you saw that. And even though you had, you know, detours and trouble along the way, as in, you know, your superior <laughs> officer, um, you, you can't help but know that he's probably, even though he re- was giving you this backhanded compliment, but deep down, he probably has a lot of respect for you thinking, wow, I, I'm just so floored that she actually made it. And, you know, he's, you're somebody that he'll never forget. No, no, it's true. And the, the rumor was before I even went to the, uh, the white house to work when I was dur- during training, everyone at the white house knew me already. And they only knew me as talkback Barbie. And so when I went to the front gate the day before I was going to start working there, I went to introduce myself. I wanted to figure out where I was going to go for a roll call the next day. And I go up to the front gate and I asked this girl officer, I go, Hey, I just want to, I'm officer Lesby. That's my maiden name. And I'm in class 177. Where do I go for roll call tomorrow? She's like, you know, who are you? And when I said officer Lesby, she goes, Oh my God, I know exactly who you are. She goes, you're talk back Barbie. So everyone had already heard about me, known about me at the white house before I had even started. So my reputation proceeded to itself. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so I was just going to say, so, um, why is the book titled Talk Back Barbie? But yep. obviously that's because of your nickname. Yes, there was an incident in the book where I, when I got the nickname Talk Back Barbie and it was an incident with this technician and he, I was wearing jewelry in this reenactment scenario and he looked down and he goes, why do you have a watch on? And I said, oh, I thought this was a real life situation reenactment scenario. And he's like, you're never to wear jewelry ever in my presence. And I said, oh, I thought we weren't weren't allowed to wear jewelry in the mat room. Well, he's in front of me so close. He's spitting in my face. Like, I mean, that's how close he's talking. His face is 50 shades of red. He is so mad at me because I'm talking, I'm basically talking back to him because, and my whole class is behind me with these big eyes. And they're looking at me like, Lauren, shut up. Why do you keep saying more and more? Instead of the first thing I said, I kept on and on. I'm like, excuse me, but I'm proving you wrong because you actually are incorrect. And I, he was wrong, but that's why he was getting so angry because I was proving that he was wrong. He just wanted me to shut up and go away and I wouldn't do it. So I had to go call my sergeant. And ever since that day, they nicknamed me Talk Back Barbie because I would never keep my mouth shut. And I always questioned everything he did and he would make me go write a memo because of it. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us in, um, in a few words um, exactly is the book, what the book is about? Yes. It's just about a sassy, ambitious Southern blonde who just wants to prove to the world that she can do this. And she goes and works for the Secret Service and proves that she can be something that everybody else thought she couldn't be. And so it's really, you think about Miss Congeniality meets Legally Blonde, and it's got that feel to the book where you just are laughing and you're as you're reading, you're kind of like, seriously, are you really going to do that, Lauren? Because you kind of know where it's going to go or what I'm going to say, because you've you figure out my personality very early in the book and you just kind of are like, I can't believe she didn't do that, but it's funny and it's entertaining. And I used some real situations that happened to me while I was there. And then I added in some fiction and humor for the reader's enjoyment. So that way nobody knows what's true and fi- false. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. And what, so, what, what, what kind of feedback did you get from the secret service once this book came out? So the, uh, they might not know I wrote this book yet. I don't know. But that's one reason I added some fictional stuff in there because it's a long process to get a book approved by the Secret Service. So my book is actually not a memoir. It's a nonfiction humor is the category that it's in. And the reason oh, being good. is because I I didn't want to have to, if I had to go through approval with them, it takes years. And I made sure everything in the book is unclassified. Nothing, all names have been changed. Everything in there is stuff that you can find on the internet. So it's not, nothing is disclosed, classified. Nothing is in there that is some secret. It's all just humor and stories to share about the secret service and my personal experience in the secret service. Got it. And so what can readers learn from reading your book? The biggest thing they can learn is that no matter how the world defines you, it's only you who determines if you will fail or succeed. So don't let a name define you. You define the name. And that's just what Talkback Barbie did. Talkback Barbie has so many connotations. So if someone told me, you know, called you Talkback Barbie, some people would be taken aback by that. They'd be like, Talkback Barbie, that's such an insult. But talking back can be a good or bad thing. Talking back can mean you're confident in yourself, in what you believe, in what you stand for. 
talking back could be as long as it's done respectfully just means that you are sharing an opinion. And then Barbie, yes, there are dumb blondes out there. Yes, I have a lot of Jessica Simpson moments in the book that I share, but it's Barbie doesn't mean you have to be a dumb blonde and you have to be stupid. It might mean you have some funny situations that happen to you, but you can take it or leave it as a positive or negative thing. And I, I took it positive and I ran with it. That's awesome. And so where can people buy this book? So my website, talkbackbarbie.com, you can buy the book. And if you order it through there, I personally sign every book that you order through there. The Kindle's available on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com also has the paperback online. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's, that's exciting. I, I may have to go out and uh, purchase the book because I'm, I would be, I'm dying to hear about all the behind the scenes stuff. All the it's a stuff. quick read. So even people who don't love to read, it's a quick read. I've gotten amazing feedback from it, from everyone who's read it. They said it was very entertaining and they could really feel my personality through the writing and through, and that's what I really wanted. My husband was really nervous about me writing this. He goes, are you really going to put this out to the world? All this stuff that you did? And I go, well, yeah, I'm not, I go, I don't regret any of this stuff that I did. First of all, I wrote about it because I was actually learning as I was writing the book, I was learning about myself by writing it. I learned who I was. I learned that I was a lot stronger than I thought that through my stupid mistakes and bad decisions that actually it turned me into the person I am today, which I don't regret at all. Uh, that's great. And so what are you doing today? So today I am obviously promoting my book. I'm trying to be on podcasts, TV shows, radio shows. So I do that in my spare time. I also am a mom to an eight-year-old boy and I work part-time for JRL Coal. So it's a coal company. They actually own a coal mine and I just work part-time there as an executive assistant. Okay, that's, that's cool. That's awesome. Now, one thing I want to talk about too, and we probably should have talked about this a while ago, is that I'm really big into fitness. <laughs> and so I always like to hear my guests talk to me about their fitness journey and, you know, if they've come across anything, you know, hurdles or goals that they've wanted to achieve, you know, stuff like that. So what, what kind of background do you have in fitness? Or, I mean, you said that you were involved, obviously involved in sports growing up, so... Yes. So I was involved in sports. I was mostly a runner, but I play tennis now. So I'm on a tennis team. I work out every day. I love to go in saunas and I'm very into holistic health. So I believe in healing your body from the inside out. And I do, I believe in just like different herbs and just doing everything so that our body has the best immune response possible. And by doing that, I think healing ourselves, my personal opinion is healing ourselves naturally so that we can increase this immunity within ourselves. And I do, I believe health is one of the best things you can do. And that's actually something that I believe truly reverses aging the most, but I have had the biggest hurdle I've had is I was out. I just started back, uh, because five months ago I tore my hamstring playing tennis. I was just stretching and I tore my hamstring. And so that's been one of the, I've never had an injury like this. And I just finally played my first tennis match yesterday. And I'm like, so sore. I can barely move. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I've, I've been gradually at the gym, just, I mean, I'm talking super lightweights, trying to strengthen it again so that I can get back out there and play tennis. So that's been one of my biggest hurdles is just overcoming this injury that I never thought would happen. Cause I go, I was like, I'm strong. I've been weightlifting, but the problem was I wasn't stretching enough. And I think my muscle was just too tight. I need to get back into yoga is what I really need to do. That's right. when I was in the best shape. And uh, talk to us about, about your diet. I'm very into organic, healthy eating. So we, we try not to eat out very much. Although lately I've just been with sports with my son and everything we do. We do eat out a little more than we ever have before, but I try to make healthy decisions. Like I, I stay away from fried food. I try to get other people to order fries so that I only have a few, <laughs> <laughs> but I, when I'm at home, we eat very healthy. I've been trying actually to go, I, I'm not vegan by any means, but I've been trying to cut out dairy as much as possible. So we've been doing a lot of like vegan cheeses, vegan, like sour creams and different stuff like that. Not, none of us are allergic to dairy. I just know how mucus forming it is. And it just, mm -hmm. it's just not good for us. And it's very inflammatory. And so because of that, we've been trying to, I, I can't truly give up cheese and I, I don't think I ever will, but I try to minimize it as much as possible because I feel like then I'm keeping my body as healthy as possible by minimizing these inflammatory foods. I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I don't do dairy either, and I yeah. don't do uh, I don't do gluten either. 
and I go to a homeopath also. I mm-hmm. was diagnosed with leukemia about eight about eight eight years ago, and I've never had to this day. I've never had any treatments, no chemo, no medications, and I truly believe it's from clean eating, it's, you know, from exercising, positive mindset, and just really valuing the fact that you know movement is life, and when you stop moving, you stop living. So, you know, I'll do this until, um, you know, and now, of course, I am involved in all these um, sports. I mean, I compete in bodybuilding shows, but I also got back. I ran track when in high school and college and I, I got uh, back into there's a when you turn 50, there's a, a lot of senior um, games. And I just came back this past weekend from the Huntsman World Senior Games. Mm-hmm. And um, I threw the javelin and the discus came in fourth in both events. That's amazing. And um, I pole vault too, but they didn't have pole vaulting. So it's uh, it's interesting to see these people at these events, you know, 60, 70, 80. I've had some women on my podcast, this one gal, she's 87 now, but she holds the world record in pole vaulting for her age group. Wow. So I, I see people like that and I just thought I'm on that path. And it's all about just, you know, because, you know, as you know, I'm sure 80% of your immune systems in your gut. It is. Oh, I take probiotics every day because I do like wine. And I'm like, I can't drink too much wine because it makes me fat. (laughs) Uh, But I'm I'm with you. So, you know, fun foods in moderation, but, you know, overall, you know, clean eating and, you know, and and clean and and training in the gym. And, you know, it it really does add up. It's like people ask me, what's your secret? There's no secret. It's just classic textbook, you know, just, you know, getting enough water, sleep. Yeah. Exactly. It's staying away from the fast food restaurants. I couldn't tell you the last time I've had fast food. When we go on road trips, I bring my own food in the car with me. I, we, we drink my own, you know, our own filtered water. I mean, we're, I try to stay away from plastic as much as you can. I mean, obviously when you're out and about and I'm dying of thirst, mm-hmm. I drink out of plastic water bottles, but yeah. you can only do as much as you can. Right. Uh, but I, I try to, or if I do something like that, I'll take like detox pills later or something. <laughs> you know? I, like, I, do, I do those too. <laughs> yes. I'm like, I got to detox all those toxins from that weekend or whatever you did, you know? I agree a hundred percent. Well, Lauren, it's been awesome talking to you. Um, if people are, are you on social media? I am. All okay. of my social media handles are on my website, Talk Back Barbie. So you can okay. find everything you need about me there. And if you have any questions, people can chat with me on that, on my website as well. And I am available to answer any questions or if they just want to talk, they're more than welcome to do that as well. And do you have any final thoughts for our, our listeners, especially with women who um, are hitting that second chapter? Or for me, I laugh, I'm on, I'm, I'm Helen 3.0. I'm, I'm, I'm on my third chapter. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, a lot of women at my age are not only they, their bodies are changing because of menopause, but then they're empty nesters now and they, um, might be changing careers, the relationships may be changing, they may be getting divorced after 30 years. And I know you're a lot younger, but um, with you working in this male dominated environment, you know, what are some words of advice that you can give to these women who actually might want to pursue something that might be in a male dominated, you know, arena? I loved working with men. I, honestly, I worked the best with them. They, I just seem to adapt really well. And I do one of the biggest things I think, don't let your emotions get in your way, get in the way. Just I'm very hard, hard, thick skinned. And I think that that helped me a lot in male dominated environments. You just can't take too many things personally, but just motivating women to not let the world label you and define you because so many women let what other people say about them tell them and who they are as a person. And I've just discovered through writing my book, all the experiences I've had, all the jobs that I've had, that's one of the biggest things I can say. Starting over is never easy, but I have started over so many times because I've had so many different jobs and so many different careers. And my my paths have just always just kind of gone with the wind. And now I'm actually doing something I love, which is promoting my book because I love people. So this is something I never anticipated and it, it just kind of happened. So you just take every opportunity and you just kind of go with it and let the kind of let your path guide you. And I know that sounds kind of stupid, but it's take these opportunities. And when a door shuts, go somewhere else. If someone's being negative to you, don't hang on to that friendship. Maybe it's time to walk away from that friendship and start a new one so that you can, your path will grow and that you can go and eventually do something that 
will empower you and make you happy. Well, and that's, I agree with you that you said a mouthful there. I mean, being empowered mm-hmm. and, and making yourself happy are, are key. I think a lot of women, especially my age too, um, are so used to making other people happy. And then when it comes to them, their tank is empty. That's right. And I deal, don't get me wrong. I deal with that all the time. You go through spouts of you're hard on yourself. You're depressed. I mean, with, with me pulling my hamstring, tearing my hamstring, I was, I was a little down and out. I mean, I was out of shape all that for years that I'd been working out and all that muscle I had gained. I lost it all. I'm now weaker than I've ever been because now I'm having to gradually build it back up. So you do get discouraged and depressed. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I never do. It's about though, getting through those days of being run down and tired and discouraged and saying, Hey, if I can just get it, get to the gym every day, I'm happy. If I can just lift these five pound weights for the next couple of months and then increase to eight, I'm happy because you know what, that is going to get me to where I need to go, but it's going to be a slow road and it's going to be hard. Just like the secret service training was hard. It, when you hurt yourself, even though, you know, you didn't intend for it to happen, it's a hard reco- road to recovery, but you have to be patient and you have to give yourself time and you have to give your body time to heal. And if you can do that and get, I like to have a good support system too. I think that's super, super important to have family, mom, sister, brother, somebody that you can talk to about what you're dealing with or, you know, the struggles that you're having that day, somebody who can really relate to you and help you through it. I agree hundred percent. All right. And I think we will end on that. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for um, taking the time to chat about you and your book and your life. I find it super, super fascinating and I'm definitely going to probably try to pick up the book and, and see, uh, because I think about when I was there and then think about now that I know somebody who was actually working there too, <laughs> I can kind of put two and two together. And, and, right. Uh, oh, every time, I love it. Every time Thank I see you. something on TV and I'll see the president sitting, you know, in these, those two little yellow state chairs, I go, I sat in that chair. <laughs> like, like I've been there. It's so I cool. Know. It's, it's really, really <laughs> cool. All right, Lauren, well, you have an awesome day and uh, thank you so much for, again, for joining Thank you for having me. I, this Bye. was a pleasure and so much fun. All right. Take care. Bye. I am so glad I was able to interview someone like Lauren. It seems like there are always certain jobs out there that we all find fascinating. And I'm so tickled that I was able to interview Lauren to hear about her job in detail and what life was like really behind the scenes, especially in this male dominated arena. A couple of takeaways that I took from the interview. First, Lauren knew from a very young age that she wanted to work for the government in this capacity. I think we all have dreams of doing something big when we were young, yet how many of us let those dreams just slide by? Lauren said that we should take every opportunity and go with it and let your path guide you as you pursue those goals and dreams. She also said, don't let the world label or define you. Sometimes we're just too timid to jump or take that leap of faith. Be empowered. You know what you want. There's no reason for you not to go out and get it. And that is at any age. Another important aspect she talked about was having a great support system. Being successful in anything is hard work. Not only do we have to work hard for what we believe in and what we want to achieve, but we also need that community of support to help us along the way. When she first thought about writing a book, it was just a thought, an idea, a dream. But those thoughts, those ideas, and those dreams became a reality, not only due to her drive to succeed, but because of the great support system that she had surrounding her. Don't forget, it's never too late to start something new. Who else out there wants to write a book, develop a new skill, or take on a new job? My motto always is, jump and the net will appear. Give it a shot. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Again, thank you so much for listening to another chapter, another episode of the Age is Irrelevant podcast. If you would like to find Lauren, you can check her out on social media at Talkback Barbie on Instagram. She's also at TalkbackBarbie at gmail.com if you want to shoot her an email. She has a website, TalkbackBarbie.com, and her book is in bookstores and on Amazon. You can find me 
at www.aidisirrelevant.com or if you want to shoot me an email, I'm at Helen at aidisirrelevant.com. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this interview, my other interviews, please drop me a five-star review and a uh, review on iTunes. That would be awesome. And share this podcast with someone that you think might enjoy it also. And until next time, don't forget, age truly is irrelevant. Bye-bye.